Looking over 30 years, God, how, how can we say thank you? Lord, accept to just humbly offer you all that we are today. God, as we open up your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that you are the true teacher of the church. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. The Lord will give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, today, as we celebrate 30 years of the Rock Church and World Outreach Center on our birthday weekend, God, we ask for a gift. We ask, God, that you would bless all the churches here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel. God, there are brothers and sisters, and Lord, as a gift to us, we pray that you would bless them, encourage them, strengthen them, guide and direct them, Lord. I pray, Father God, that you'd add extra people to their flock, God. I pray that there'd be extra people raising their hands for salvation this weekend, God. I ask, Lord, that your spirit would continue to move and be poured out all over the earth, God. Watch over our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad in the nations, Lord. We would ask, God, that you watch over them, protect them, deliver them. Lord, may they endure to the end, to the glory of God. It's in Jesus' mighty name we're all in agreement. We say... Amen. Today, get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Nehemiah. And we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter number one. First couple of verses in Nehemiah chapter number one. If you find the Psalms go back just a little ways. If you find the Kings or Chronicles head forwards a little ways. Past Ezra, you'll find Nehemiah. I find that there are many parallels in the Word of God with our lives. The Bible tells us that everything has been given for an example for us. Looking back over the 30 years and and trying to think about what to say on a day like today, we have to go back to the beginning. Because the Rock Church and World Outreach Center started in a rented hotel room at the Econo Lodge over here, San Bernardino, with 12 people and a box of Kleenex. Now, the box of Kleenex was not because they started in June and it was the June gloom and the flu season and the, the spring flowers and all that kind of stuff and the pollen count was high. But it was because they had broken hearts. They had broken hearts for a broken city. And and they were praying and crying over the lost people of this area, of the Inland Empire. And it was that inception, it was that start. And with that in mind, I want to take you to Nehemiah chapter number 1. And we're going to take a look at verse number 1 through 4. Look at what it says in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, verse 2, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Now, I want you to notice something here in the second verse. His brethren come. There's been a captivity that has happened because God's word is true. And God had told the children of Israel, if you will hold to my words, then I will bless you. I will prosper you in the land that I'm giving to you. You're, you're going to have fields and, and harvest. You're going to lend to many nations and borrow from none. Your enemies will come at you in one direction and they will flee from you in several. But he said, if you do not hold to my commands, if you don't hold to my words, then I will scatter you to the nations. And God's word came to pass because as they went throughout the times of the kings, uh, the, the kings were wicked, many of them. In fact, all of the kings of Israel were wicked and turned the hearts of the people to idolatry. And so they went into captivity and eventually Judah... Second of all, went into captivity. So here Nehemiah is in a foreign land, serving a foreign king. They've been held captive. And so some of his brethren come back and he asks them, how are the people and how is Jerusalem? Notice his first concern was for the people and the second concern was for a place. Now, why was he concerned about the place? Here's the reason why. is because the place represented something. It represented the presence of God. That's what Jerusalem represented. It was the city of peace. It was the city where the temple of God was built. It was the city of David, right? And that was where God said, I would set up your house before you forever, your kingdom. And so that place represented something of national pride for Israel. It was a place that represented the presence of God and the connection with God and, once again, his people. Now, look at what's said in verse number three. It says, and they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. Notice two words, great distress and reproach. Two things about the people. They are in great distress. They're hurting. They're broken. And reproach. What does that mean? That means they're the laughing stock. They're a byword. They're scorned among the nations. People are walking by, wagging their heads, going, look at these guys. They thought that they were all that. 
Solomon in all his glory. And now look at what's going on. David and this mighty warrior who took down giants. And now look at the state that they're in. Great reproach. It goes on and says, the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now, we don't know this because in our day and age, we don't have walled cities, but walled cities were, were safe. There were places that if you were living outside of the city, if bands of raiders came in or another nation came against you, you could run into the safety of the city. The walls represented that strength of the city and that safety that they could enjoy. And the gates represented a place of business. It was the place of commerce. It was the marketplace oftentimes that people went in and out. They could buy and sell. They could trade there. As well, it was a place where decisions were made for the community. It was actually a place of government. So we see that the safety and the government and the economy of Jerusalem has been broken down. Once again, representing the state of the people. Verse number four, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And then it goes on in Nehemiah chapter number one, a beautiful prayer is written. It's a prayer of repentance. It's a prayer asking God to bring back the captivity, to remove the reproach. And then it's a prayer to ask God for favor. Now in Nehemiah chapter number two, something takes place is that he goes before the king and he asks for some things. He asks for some, some resources. He asks for protection. He asks for authority to go and to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, many commentators, and if you ask many people in this room, if you ask them what Nehemiah is all about, the entire book, they would say it's about building a wall. It's about a building project. Nehemiah is all about building back the walls that were broken down, restoring the rubble and the ruins. And I would say, yeah, that's in there, but that is not what the book is about. The book is about a people who were lost, who were broken, who were hurting, who were in great distress and reproach, and how God raised them up and brought them back in from their captivity, and how God restored them, and how there was a spiritual awakening that took place. Because the wall was built all the way up until chapter number seven of Nehemiah, but the book doesn't stop there. It continues on, and it talks about what took place with the people. See, it's not about that. And for this church, we're come 30 years and there are many things that have taken place. This building's been built. We've bought buses. We, we've got outreach programs and all those sorts of things. But it was never about any of those things. It was always about the people. That's what chapter one is all about. And that's what our lives are all about. I want to tell you about this, but I don't want to tell you in my words. We asked our founders if they would tell you in their words what they experienced and how it took place. Check out the overheads. If you only knew how it began, boy, it began up in Lake Arrowhead as this woman was praying. Why don't you tell Thank them? God somebody was praying. <laughs> it was me out of desperation. We lived in a house on the edge of Lake Arrowhead. And I would look at all the city lights and God gave me a word and he said, I'll give you treasures out of darkness. He said, I want you to pray over the city. I want you to begin to understand that I'm going to take you there and you're going to start a church. I did not want a pastor no. anymore, no. anywhere, you didn't. let alone San Bernardino. No. Jim realized that God had called him to preach and he wasn't going to run from it anymore. We met at the Econo Lodge in a hotel We had 12 room, people. And we absolutely said, Lord, if this is going to be your church, you're going to have to make this happen. December 24th, December 24th Christmas Eve in our brand new building. 1989. 1989. <laughs> you know, one of the things that was happening is the church was really growing. We had gotten a hold of an altar call that God gave me. It's not because I'm anointed. It's because he told me what to say to the people. And over the years, he has built this fabulous, like she was just mentioning, a fabulous congregation. And we started getting these massive services that had, you know, hundreds of people being saved. And we had this one weekend where we had like 700 salvations. We couldn't get them out of the service fast enough through one single door. So we had to double and triple and quadruple the size of the door. And so they would get out uh, fast. Everybody's out so we could dismiss the people. That's how the church started to grow. And we knew that we needed to build a building because God had spoken. 
What we're going to be doing is we're going to stop renting in a few years here. We're going to start purchasing our own property so that we can expand the kingdom of God and build the Rock Christian Center, but more importantly, build your ministry, your children's ministry, so that there can be a foundation to reach a lost and dying, hurting world for Jesus Christ. 20 years ago, when we were looking for land, we felt like the Lord had said, San Bernardino, this is where I called you. In a bad neighborhood, in a, you know, a city that's not growing, in a city that was bankrupt. People don't want to go to. In a to. city that didn't yeah. want us, yeah. and a city that had a history of being the graveyard of pastors. And we decided that what we were going to do is build something that's going to be a monument to his glory. I remember when we broke ground, you know, it was rocky soil. In other words, it's really interesting. This whole area is a, is a, a bed a of rocks, it's a, a river bed. Yeah, it's a river and you can go up town anywhere you want, start digging down, you got boulders. And you know, the Bible says a lot about rocky soil. Boy, spiritually, that's what this place was, you know. And I'll never forget because Pastor Luke uh, came and he came from Bible college. I, don't, I, I haven't seen a church out there that reaches out to the people like our church reaches out to the people out here. And our church is not just the church, it's the World Outreach Center. And, this church is going to go somewhere. And we invited him to come and pray over the, the ground to represent the next generation. We have broken the ground. I had, every time I came over to the building as they were building it, and it was a, you know, just a skeleton of a building with walls that had been tilted up in dirt everywhere. And I remember coming and I asked God, I said, God, one of the things I want to do is I want to be alone because there's always people. Uh, I want to be alone. I want to talk to you about the building. I don't want to talk to the people. I don't want to walk around the building with people. I want to talk to you, God. Please, can you make arrangements for me to be alone with you so I can share these moments with you? And um, as I was walking through the building, here comes four people and, and they were, I don't know how to use the word, they were handicapped, I guess is a yeah, word you might want to use, and had some challenges wow. and they were kind of together and they had taken a bus on this hot day over here and uh, I was, I saw them in the distance and you know how, how un, unspiritual I am and totally carnal. I was trying to avoid them, you know, but they spotted me. And, the, and so I said, hey, how are you? And they said, oh, Pastor, Pastor, we're so happy to see you. Tell us about the building, what's what and where. So I ended up for the next hour and a half walking them through the building. And I remember that this platform that we're on right now, the, which is the, in the main sanctuary, that the walls weren't here so I could see back as they were leaving and they were walking out across the dirt and you know their little feet were pounding on the dust and the dirt and the dirt was coming up as they were walking to the bus stop here in the corner and this hot day is probably 100 degrees and I'm here and I'm saying to God I'm just complaining like a big baby I talked to God I said God uh, I'm just so disappointed I wanted to spend this time with you I'll never forget what God said God spoke to me he said you just did I tell you when you take care of people you can expect the presence of God and that's what this church is all about it's the people that God brought to build this house. And I just want to say thank you to the people. Whether you're here or you're not here, it's all recorded in heaven. And we're grateful and we're, we thank you for what you've done for this house and for this place and for the Lord through your contributions. And it's a healthy place. In order for us to stay healthy, I would like you to welcome you new lead pastors. I couldn't be happier than the generation that's coming up right now. Strong, healthy, uh, alive. Take, they took instant ownership uh, of the whole ministry. And we think this is a great place, but great people make it a great place. I love that. Great people make it a great place. And it was God bringing the people. God bringing people who had a heart for people, what God's heart was after. God saving souls and adding to the church daily those that were being saved. And we realized that in order to accomplish what God had called us to accomplish, we needed to do some things. We needed to reach out. We needed to start to get into our city and create the change that we wanted to see. 
The very first message that was ever preached at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center gave us the insight that we needed for these ministries. Isaiah chapter 58 was the very first message that was ever preached here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center by our founding pastor, Pastor Jim Cobray. And I want to read a section of scripture in Isaiah 58, verse number 6 through verse number 12, and remind us of where we started what the goal is, and why we do what we do as a church. Isaiah 58, starting in verse number 6, says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. See, a yoke was a burden. It was laid on the necks of people. And they would work hard, and it dragged them down. And yet God says, I don't want them burdened with sin and with depression, with discouragement with the weight of the things that the world has on them. It's for you to break every yoke and let them go free. Verse 7, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? See, the Inland Empire has been looked down upon. There's been a great distress and there's been reproach. People look at this place and say, this could have been a great place. Look at the area, look at the mountains, look at all the resources. And yet, look at what a lost and broken and hurting place it is. L.A. Times says that this is a place where people go to lose hope. And they entitled their section of of, uh, different articles about this place called Broken. That's what they've said about San Bernardino. And that's what they've said about the Inland Empire. And yet it says that we are to bring the poor and the outcast into our house. Everyone is welcome here. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. We will love you while God works on you and while God raises you up and restores you. This is a house for all goes on in verse number seven. It says, when you see the naked that you cover them and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Verse number eight, then your light will break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Verse number nine, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry, and isn't that what we do every time? We break open the bread of life. Isn't that what we do naturally and physically every time, Tuesday and Thursday, when we feed the poor? Isn't that what we do when we go to the streets, when we bring the love of Jesus to our community? It goes on and says, and satisfy the afflicted soul. Then your light shall dawn in the darkness. Your darkness shall be as the noonday. I love that because that's the promise that God gave Pastor Deborah. I will give you treasures out of darkness goes on in verse number 11, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Pastor Deborah was praying and she realized that there was a story in the Bible about Aksa. And she came and she asked her father for water. She asked for springs of water. They needed them. And she didn't just ask for water. She asked for the upper springs as well as for the lower springs. A lot of time people in our society, they want the rich, they want the wealthy, they want the high, the upper. And yet, we didn't just stop there. We said, no, God, give us the poor, give us the hurting, give us the brokering, give us every drug dealer, every pimp, every prostitute, God, every ex-something, God. We want them right out of the prisons, God. We want them right off the streets, Lord. We want everyone, God, that you want to bring to this place, God. We will take them. God, we ask you for the upper springs, but God, we also ask you for the lower springs, You will be like a well-watered garden and like a spring of water. We've dug some wells, and yet I believe that we're coming into a new season where there will be streams flowing out of this place. Verse number 12, those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. That's what this church is, and that's what our call, that's what our mandate is. That is our chapter one. That is our launching pad. That is the foundation that has been built around us. I want to show you once again where this church has come from with our outreach programs. Check out the overheads. Man, I remember when you used to go out in a truck feeding people in in downtown San Bernardino. I had about 120 scriptures written down on my Bible on the poor, because we were in a poor city. And the Lord began to just put in me, Isaiah 58 was our foundation chapter on the fast that God had chosen and the love of God. First message ever preached, Isaiah 58. It was, and that's how it started. It started with beans and rice. I knew there was hungry people. Jim wanted to fill up buses, and I'm thinking, oh great, how are we going to get people in buses? 
And he said to me, what are you going to do? And I said, can I go to 5th Street and G Street? We just started bringing groceries to hungry people. We'd knock on the door and we'd say, it's the end of the month. Are you hungry? We've got some extra food here. And would you like some prayer? And you know what? I was so shocked because I'd never done this before. And the people opened the doors to me and they were so kind and they were so hungry to have somebody help them. It started with just beans and rice and then it started to grow and more people came along and we made mistakes and we figured this out and Manon came on. And... I had another little girl in the rock in the streets. Um, she was about two and a half years old and at the time I didn't know it but um, another person that was out of volunteer had snapped a picture of this little girl and I talking and she was about two and a half, three years old. And um, she talked like an adult because she was basically raising herself. And I asked her where her mom and dad were, and she goes, oh, they're asleep. And here's this little girl out here all by herself. And um, I got to share Jesus with her that day. And I asked God to protect her. And I saw her several times at other locations because they moved around a lot. And then I lost contact with her, but her name was Aurora. And uh, I will forever remember Aurora as well. And this is just one of many, many, many examples of uh, love uh, in the streets of San Bernardino. There's a lot of people that are just not as blessed as, as we are, or maybe you are. But you know, thank God for a church that will care for them. And I found out that no matter if they come to church or don't come to church, that wasn't the issue. I, tr I thought if I fed them and loved them, they would come to church. It wasn't true. But I found out something else. I found out that God came to church here because we took care of the poor. It was pleasing to the Lord. So not always do we get results from things that we think, but we get results in different ways. So don't despise small beginnings because we went from a closet to a large warehouse. Uh, currently today, we have a 6,500 square foot warehouse where we have refrigerator units and semi-trucks and we bring in massive, tons and tons of food each year. And last year we fed over a half a million people from this warehouse. And when I found out that God had a heart for the poor, I could hardly wait to give them as much as we could and with great dignity and honor. When you delight yourself in the Lord and you really fall in love with Him, He suddenly begins to put His desires in your heart. We say that the Inland Empire shall be saved. Just like Nehemiah, we had to build a safe place for people to come. We had to build a place that would govern and give the authority back to the people over the devil and over the mentalities that are in our area. Things that would hold us back to break those yokes and build a healthy church and our numerous outreach programs. That didn't even mention the prison ministry, the convalescent hospital ministry, the homeless ministry. It didn't mention any of those things that we do. We've got so many things that are going on here at The Rock. See, we see the first phase was to build a church. But oftentimes in our minds, the first phase and the first chapter are disconnected. And we look at Nehemiah and we say, well, that was just about building a wall. And yet, it was never just about building a wall. In fact, if you look at the time frame, it was only a couple of months that it took them to build that wall. There was a point where chapter 7 came along and a census took place and they started to purify the priesthood and then all of a sudden spiritual revival broke out in the midst of the nation of Israel. I believe that the 30 years that it's taken for us to get to this point, that that has been building the wall. And yet it's never been about the walls of this building. It's never been about the buses that we bought. It's never been about the programs that we built. It's always been about our chapter number one, about the people that are in great distress and reproach. We are raising up the waste places. We are rebuilding those ruins. We are getting a hold of people's lives. And I believe that today is our chapter seven. I believe that this is a teeter-totter moment that we're about ready to cross over into what God has for this church. I believe that there are things ahead of us that we're going to reach people in a a greater way and that spiritual revival is going to break out in San Bernardino in the Inland Empire and it's going to spread to the uttermost ends of the earth because God is getting ready to take us to a new place. He's raising us up. There are waters that are going to flow out of this house and we are going to be restore the breach, a repair of the streets to dwell in. This is a place with a people who are going to be known as those who can fix anything. People are going to seek you out and ask you what's different about your life. What's happening 
happened to you. I knew you when you used to run the streets, and yet look at your life. Look how blessed you are. And you're going to be able to tell them it's because I've got Jesus. I've got the King of glory. He's changed my life. He saved me. He's raised me up. I used to be lost and broken, hurting and dying. I was down in the streets, and yet I found the love that changed everything for me. God wants to do it. God wants to do it. And today, church, I can hear the sound in heaven. The gun has been fired. The flag has been waved. The hand has dropped. It's time for us to get going in a new way on what God has called this church to do because of who we are. There is no other rock than our King Jesus. There is no other purpose on this earth than the people that God wants to save. What God wants to do. God wants to build this place healthy and strong. And the goal for all of us is till Jesus comes. I want to close out with a promise that had been given to Pastor Jim years ago. Pastor Deborah was going through some things in her office, and she found one of Pastor Jim's old Bible. She started to look through it, and in the leaf of the Bible, it had this written. It's up here on the overheads. May 3rd, 1994, a promise from God about the rock given in prayer. 2 Samuel 7, 25 through 29, and it says this, Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. Verse 26, So let, the name, let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God forever over Israel. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. Verse 28, now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true. You have promised this goodness to your servant. Verse 29, now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it, and with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. I believe that's both a promise and a prayer for all of us for the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Today